This morning we're going to finish up. We've been th three Sundays talking about revival, um, how it comes, um, and how it stays. Um, and one of the conversations that we had a couple Tuesday nights ago, and I think Will brought this up, is if you study through Nehemiah uh, to the end. Matter of fact, if you go to Malachi, Malachi is the last kind of a minor prophet that God raised up to speak into the life of Israel. Um, um, on the other side of uh, this, what we're going to be looking at, when the temple was rebuilt and the walls were re or reconstructed, um, the worship continued. Um, who knows what happened? There you go, Rick. <laughs> People got comfortable. They turned away from God again. Um, and we can say it like that, and I can say it like that, but the reality is as we sit here at the end of 2019, uh, who would be honest to say that we too can uh, also be like that? Um, we looked at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, uh, where the writer of Hebrews says that we have to be on guard against drifting away from the things that we heard, and we know that to be Christ, chapter 1 of Hebrews. But, and so that's what we're going to look at again this morning. Um, just to kind of reiterate what we looked at, I want to read down through chapter 1 of Nehemiah um, as we finish up kind of talking about revival, because... If you know the story of Nehemiah along with Ezra and Zerubbabel and a lot of other folks that were associated with them in this, in this story about them coming out of captivity as God promised that they would, that God would bring them back into the land and, and the worship would be reestablished. For me, as I look at this, his, Nehemiah specifically, uh, we're going to look at just very briefly at Ezra this morning as well, but um, I think it's a great uh, thing to look at when it comes to revival because Nehemiah had that in his heart as he began to pray and to seek the Lord and and he realized that things weren't going the way uh, that they should have been going. Things were broken down. And, and uh, really what he's talking about is revival. You know, he had it in his heart to go back and to be part of that the rebuilding project, specifically of the walls and the gates that weren't rebuilt, um, but also for the, for the greater worship of God and what God had given them to do. And, and so there's some principles and things we can take from this. Um, you know, as I begin to process through this and talk with some of you over the last couple of weeks, uh, I know some, one of the questions that came up, you know, does God have to do this in us? Does he have to um, give, kind of give us an interest or a desire to be revived? And I think, yes, God is working in that. But when we see here, and we see that Nehemiah talks a good bit about the Lord, but he heard the information, and because of his remembrance of what God had said uh, through the prophets, he knew where he was at in history, with God's history. And so there's something in him that moved forward. Um, you know, I was talking with <laughs> some folks here recently, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that God's not a puppeteer. You know, God's sovereign, he's in control, he knows the beginning from the end, but at the same time, there's this idea of kind of like what Joshua said, you know, it's for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. You make your decision, I'm going to make my decision on what I'm going to do. And so there is choice. Um, actually, Trace and I were talking about this, this a little bit this morning before I came down, is the topic of obedience. Obe I mean, and when you look from Genesis chapter 2, when God gives the command to Adam, <laughs> Eve's not there yet, to Adam, you, could, you know, you're to manage everything. Matter of fact, you can name things. You can be in complete control. But the one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't take from it. Don't eat that fruit. That was a command. There was an expected obedience to that. We know the rest of the story. Here we sit. Some of us sick this morning. Uh, still feeling the curse of that. Um, and when you study the Bible from Genesis 3, where we see the act of disobedience, all the way down, if you wanted to say take it to Revelation 3, the last church that Jesus addresses, the church that was in Laodicea, uh, there's always a, a command for obeying God's word with the action to do it. Um, and when we don't, um, God in his grace uh, sends um, you know, messages we see through prophets and even Jesus speaking to the church, the command to repent, and that means action on our part, to turn from something and turn towards, towards God. So there are some keys to revival that I think we can see in the life here of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah 1, we'll start here in verse 1, go to the end of the chapter. It says, these are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. It says, in late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress or the citadel of Susa. And and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity. This would have been underneath the leadership of Zerubbabel. Uh, and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. 
In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. <clears throat> then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. I confess that we, and remember he's including himself in this, I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you have gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. And he quotes from God's word, If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations, and that happened. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayer of those of us who delight in honoring you. <clears throat> please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. And so we know about four months later, um, you'll see the month of Nisan in chapter 2. So there's about a three to four months time frame. And so Nehemiah continued to do this, weep and to pray and to fast and to seek God on behalf of the children of Israel. And then doing his job as cupbearer, he goes in front of King Artaxerxes. We know the story. His countenance was drawn and, and king, the king knew something was up. Um, and then God gave um, Nehemiah favor in front of the king. And then from that, he goes back um, with resources, with letters of permission to get through, um, you know, a long journey, actually, probably eight or nine month journey to, to most of it probably on foot. But we know it to be modern day southern Iran over to, to Jerusalem. And so he goes back and he begins to rebuild. And so, you know, as I kind of look down through uh, chapter one, um, we're going to look at uh, chapter 8 and chapter 9 this morning. We're not going to look at all 13 chapters. It's actually a great uh, a book to read just to see how God used Nehemiah and others and all the obstacles and things that they had to overcome through, with the help of God and how they rebuilt the, um, the wall and how, how worship uh, started up again. But uh, the, one of the things that we talked about a couple Sundays ago was, and we see that here in uh, Nehemiah 1, first by the hearing, Nehemiah 2, as he gets to... Uh, Jerusalem, he puts his eyes on the building project, so he sees it firsthand. And the one thing that we talked about was uh, making sure that there's an accurate assessment done on the situation. So for us, how do we, I mean, what's, what's accurately assessing our own lives look like? This is what Mike said, he's you know, quoting out 2 Corinthians 13, 5, where Paul says to examine ourselves, test ourselves, to see if our faith is genuine. He says, is Christ in you? That's the, really, isn't that the examination right there, the test? Is Jesus in my life? Does the Spirit live in my life? I mean, Romans 8 says, without the Spirit, we're not His. You know, is the Spirit living in my life? You know, you begin to examine yourself based off of the Scripture. And, you know, the reality is we're not perfect. Um, I mean, who does an examination of the Bible as you look at what it looks like to be a follower of Christ and you're like, man, good grief, that's, that's a pretty serious call. And, but there's nothing wrong with that. And so doing this accurate assessment, I think, is vital. And that's what uh, Nehemiah did before he started the project. He accurately assessed the situation. Now, for him, he was just simply looking at the rubble and, you know, how do we put this back together and get these walls? Because back in that day, having walled cities was an important thing to keep the enemies at bay. And so he knew for worship to be happening in the temple, the walls and the gates had to be reestablished. And Nehemiah kind of was like somewhat of a businessman, a worker, had these giftings. Now, we're going to see a different gifting that Ezra has here in a little bit. But accurately assessing the situation and being honest with the assessment. I mean, he looked at it, he said, man, you know what my brother said is true, man, this is broke down. And so what am I going to do about it? And like Mike said, there's this important, uh, this important idea even for us today to examine ourselves, to test ourselves. Man, where am I at? Search, asking God to search our hearts. Um, you know, is there anything in me that would be kind of wicked in his sight? And Lord, help me to, uh, to realize that and to see that and to confess that and to turn and all that. And so the first thing, this is just a review. So we're looking at some principles of these um, these ideas, or this idea of having uh, something in our lives that would bring this kind of a revival, something God would honor. Uh, so I just kind of titled it Four Keys to Genuine Revival. And 
Um, when we first started this two Sundays ago, we talked about this first one that we see here in verse 4 of chapter 1 of Nehemiah, uh, brokenness or humility. Brokenness and humility. You know, when Nehemiah caught wind of what was going on, uh, his very first reaction when he heard this was there's, a, there's an idea of kind of a brokenness in his heart, a, a humility before the Lord. He, he began to feel uh, maybe the pain for the people there. Um, I think more he felt the pain and the brokenness of God's heart. That this is how worship was supposed to be happening, and it's not happening. And he he had the heart of God, and he breaks here. Uh, we say see that he his, it says his legs became weak, or he sat down. That the idea of just kind of giving way it says he wept there, um, and it says for days I uh, he says I mourned. Um, you know I underlined the the word days there because it's not singular; it's actually plural. It, it wasn't just kind of hey one and done. I I heard what happened. You know my brother told me this. And I kind of prayed today and and faster for today, and then tomorrow I'm just going to go back to being what I'm doing or whatever. And, but it's a, it's a plural word. He did it for a number of days. And when we look at the, uh, the story here into chapter 2 of Nehemiah, we know that, it, like I said, it was three to four months this was his condition, weeping and praying and seeking God and fasting. As a matter of fact, it says there in verse, um, it was verse 6, praying night and day for your people Israel. He was doing this all, all the time. I mean, who would be able to say that. I pray night and day. I pray night and day. You know, when you look at Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, it says that he goes up to the mountain and prays all night, all night, comes down from the mountain in the morning and starts ministry. Starts ministry. Prays all night, getting strength from the Father, and then comes down from the mountain, and then the people press into him after praying night and day. And well, obviously we can see you know, with his, this broken spirit, this humility that Nehemiah had before the Lord, why God was going to use uh, such a man. <clears throat> but before we get into the last two, the kind of uh, keys, two, three, and four, what got Israel in trouble? That's, I'm going to look at that real briefly. What got Israel in trouble? What brought God's judgment to them? Rick said, idolatry? How'd that happen? What's that? Did you say unlawful? Yeah, unlawful. Yeah, unlawful marriage. Uh, they were permitting their sons and daughters to marry uh, in marrying in contradiction to God's command for them. Matter of fact, that's what we're going to look at. And so through that, what happened? The sons would be marrying the uh, daughters of those who were worshiping other gods. And, and vice versa, the same thing. And so listen to this. I just want to bring this up because this is the issue that got them where they're at. Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you guys know the story or the, the chronological story of what's happening here, um, basically the children of Israel, they did not trust God, and so they weren't permitted to go into the promised land, and so God had them wander uh, around um, for 40 years with Moses until uh, that generation died off. And then, so we're sitting here in Deuteronomy 7, just um, east of the Jordan River. They're getting ready to go into the Promised Land. And so Moses is now reiterating the commands to this new generation of people, of the children of Israel, going into, um, into the Promised Land. And this is what he has to say. As a matter of fact, Deuteronomy, if you know that book, it actually means uh, second law or second giving of the law. It's just kind of Moses retelling what the children of Israel already knew as they get ready to go in. But listen, and it's exactly what Mike said. Deuteronomy 7. It says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are about to enter and occupy, it says, He will clear away many nations ahead of you, the Hittites, the Gershites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. These seven nations are greater and more numerous than you. When the Lord your God hands these nations over to you and you conquer them, you must completely destroy them. Make no treaties with them and show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. Do not let your daughters and your sons marry their sons and daughters. For they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. And that's the story of Israel all the way down to Malachi. All the way through the history of Israel. The anger of the Lord will burn against you and he will quickly destroy you. This is what you must do. You must break down their pagan altars and shatter their sacred pillars. Cut down their Asherah poles and turn or burn their idols. For you are a holy people. The idea behind that word holy means separated, sanctified. You know, I'm not taking part of this other stuff. You are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. 
All of the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you, of all the people on the earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. Do you think that's too hard? <laughs> I mean, I was looking at that. Do you think that's a pretty hard command? Do you think it's fair that God would, would give them such a command? We've got to be careful, I think, how we answer this. Because the disobedience to this command got him jammed up over and over again. This is what Mike said was like when you understand the character of who God is, you understand that He is a loving God. He is a loving God. He's slow to anger. He's very merciful. But there's who, who here knows God can do what God wants to do? He's going to do what He wants to do, and and He chose. And we go back to Abram. Then He chose. He looks down on the the sons of men, and He sees a person. He, it's His decision. We have no say in the matter. We have no counsel for Him. He looks down. He can do what He wants, and He sees this man. He says, "You know what? I'm going to make." The, uh, the, uh, this nation great from this man. He ter- he name becomes Abraham, and Abraham's even not a perfect man, but God chose him, and from that, from that lineage, this is what we see here today. God has chosen to honor himself and to, uh, to show himself uh, through a group of people. Who is God honoring himself and showing himself through today? What's that? The church, the Christians. Remember when Paul writes uh, to Timothy, <laughs> says, You are the household of God, this temple, the pillar and foundation of truth. The church upholds the truth of who God is. You know, in the moment that we move away from truth, what happens? What's that? <laughs> You're an error. And God's going to step into that. You know, but today, we, like, you know, I hear some folks be like, you know, well, when you're talking obedience, man, you're kind of getting too close to legalism. I heard somebody one time say, you know, that when we get into the Bible and we read things, especially in the New Testament, we don't like what it says. We call it legalism. Well, I don't want to be legalist. I, but who knows obedience is key? Obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll what? Obey me. You'll keep my commands. John 14, 15, and 14, 21 through 23. But... If you love me, and one of the evidences is going to be obedience, a loving obedience to, to God. And we see this in here. The reason why God gives them this command is because he knows that once they do that, and that's exactly what happens. You know, it would be like me allowing Caleb or Rachel to marry someone that serves whatever. Who knows at that moment, all hell is going to break loose in that house. you got one serving Jehovah, the Lord God Almighty, and you got one over here serving whatever, and who knows there's going to be darkness in that house. The Caleb say, listen, I'll just use Caleb. He's got broad shoulders. He can deal with it. He marries somebody that's just not a believer. And maybe she's following, actually, you know, pretty serious after something else. He's going to have problems until, unless the Lord, the Lord does something wonderful. Paul says, obviously, you stay with a wife. You don't go into that. But if you happen to marry, you're, you're married and you, you come to faith and all of a sudden you realize my other, the other one's not. He says, by your testimony, you may very well win that person over to, to Christ. But... And I've used my mom as a huge testimony. My mom does not recommend it. She was married to somebody that wasn't a believer for about 26, 27 years or so around that. And I can remember she had nothing but trouble. But who knows when you're married, the husband and wife together, great, there's great blessing there. And for anybody that's, I mean, you're married to someone that's not a believer, man, stay the course. Stay the course. Pray for him. Be a witness. That's what my mom did. And my, my stepfather came to know Christ weeks before he died because of my mother's witness. And that was what he said. It was because my mother, how my mother lived her life. But this is a huge command that we've got to be careful of not intermarrying. We've got to be careful of yoking ourselves together with things that are, that are of this world. Because what happens over time, they begin to draw you away from Christ. You begin to compromise a little bit. And that's what got them in all this trouble. Mm-hmm. Women will throw a cork wrench in your, in, in your wisdom. <laughs> Nothing gets you women. Those women will. The ones that were serving other gods. That's what, I mean, it feels right. That's exactly what happened. Solomon knew better. I mean, I, I don't even remember, what is the number? 300 wives, 700 concubines. Is that what, I mean, is that right, Mike? I don't, I don't, that's somewhere around there. He had a boatload. He had a boatload. And what happened was those wives and concubines and whatever was going on back then began to draw, and Solomon admits to it at the end of his life, 
drew him away from the worship of the Lord. And who knows what happened coming on the other side of Solomon's life. What train wreck was right around the corner? You know, the history of God. I'll just say the history of God. <laughs> yep, and that's exactly what, I mean, what Phil said is exactly right. Right after Solomon's reign, what happened? The kingdom of Israel divided. The kingdom of Israel divided two, or ten of the ten of the twelve sons go north. Two of them, I think it was Judah and Benjamin, go south. That's where Jerusalem is. They are divided, and then from that, like what you're reading, then you have the kings that were the kings over the northern tribes, which would be Israel, then Judah of the south. Um, those two tribes, and when you look at the kings, it, it's a sad commentary on leadership. The majority of those kings were wicked, which tells us what the people normally will follow. Who's in charge? I mean, for us as Christians here today, I mean, that's a huge, um, I think, exhortation for fathers, for husbands. The house normally goes as dad goes. That's just the way it is. As, 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 however the father is leading the home, however the father is serving the Lord, nine times out of ten, um, the house goes that way. The same thing with, with leadership in the church. How the kings go, the people go. That's exactly what happened. When the kings began to worship and bow down, the people began to worship and bow down what they were worshiping, and God saw it. He would send prophets, and all that would happen. Um, and then eventually he had to step into it. But it was usually years and years down the road that he was very long-suffering towards them. It's the same thing with any kind of... You look at governments today that have wicked leadership at, at the highest levels. And I don't want to get into politics. I'm not interested in that. It's the same thing with the church. As the church leadership goes, so will the church go. You know, I mean, that's sobering to me. I, I, you know, there's a, there's a certain number of Bible verses that I have to heart that come to me instantly. One of them is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, uh, where uh, the Holy Spirit tells me that one day I will give an account for y'all. That means that I've got to be making sure that I live my life right, that I don't have secret sin or I'm hiding things. And I don't think that I am. I mean, obviously there's areas in my life that need to be tightened up or maybe some things that, whatever, but um, I know the seriousness of this. I take God's word seriously as best I can in my, in my own strength, I guess. But I, I get this. Obedience and disobedience, you know, uh, pertaining to the things of God is, is so huge. But here are four, these four keys we've talked about. We've already talked about the, this importance of brokenness in our lives. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the last three, number two, three, and four, cause, and I'm put them all together because we're going to see them as we kind of fast forward into Nehemiah a little bit. We obviously know the importance of prayer. We see that in the life of Nehemiah here in verse four. He sat down and he prayed before the God of heaven. We see the importance of God's word in Nehemiah chapter one here. He, he, he prays and he prays back God's word to him. Oh Lord, remember your word is what he's basically saying. So he knows the importance of God's word. And the fourth point is this idea of separation or sanctification or holiness. And we see that as well there in Nehemiah 1 verse 9. says, but if you return to me and obey my commands, the idea, you can get it there. It's not a direct statement. I think it's more of an indirect statement. If you return to me, the idea is if you separate from that and come back to me, you're separating unto God, but we're going to see it more clearly as we fast forward now into um, Nehemiah chapter 8. But before we get to this, um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with uh, the story of Ezra. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, matter of fact, if you just go one book back, there's Ezra. Ezra and Nehemiah uh, used to be one book together. Um, and so if you know how the captivity uh, initially from Babylon, then Persian, if you understand world dominion and all that, Persia overtook Babylon. Persia was the main empire when Nehemiah goes back at the time. Um, but Zerubbabel, uh, you'll see that in 2 Chronicles 36, the last part of that, you'll see him through Ezra. He ends up going back with a, with a number of people to rebuild the temple under Zerubbabel's leadership and others there as well. And then Ezra ends up going back, takes some more folks with him. Um, and Ezra was a scribe. That means that he was the religious leader, the religious expert, so to speak, um, of Israel. And some think that he was the scribe, the way the language is, a main teacher. And then Nehemiah, obviously a, a godly man, um, his giftings were in a different area that if you read through Nehemiah, you'll see. <clears throat> but I want to start with Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10 because we're going to see Ezra in Nehemiah chapter 8. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10, it says this about Ezra. It says, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. Why is that, 
one verse right there is so vitally important in understanding or Ezra's life and what Ezra was about ready to do in Nehemiah chapter 8. Because he's about ready to read the word of God to them. So Mike said that, that the responsibility that Ezra had was to make sure that he was prepared, that he understood it, that he was ready then to teach it to others. And that's what we see here. Ezra, number one, he first he prepared his heart. Listen, if your heart's not in it, just give up. Just give up. If, your heart's not, if, I don't, if you're not desiring the pure milk of the word, just give up. If you don't desire God's word, if you don't really believe you know, in this. Like this is the reason why most of all you see on here on Sunday mornings on the PowerPoint is, is the Bible. I, I got nothing else. That's all I want. That's all I need. My, like I said here often, my opinions don't matter. What does the Bible have to say? And that was Ezra's heart. He prepared his heart. He knew where the power was. He knew the problem was the disobedience to God's word. So he began to prepare his own heart. It said to seek the law, to seek God's word of the Lord. And then what's the next one that's so important? To do it. It wasn't that Ezra was going to teach it and then command them to do it. Ezra was doing it himself before he was making the command to them, or giving the command to them to, to, to do it. It's this idea that James 1.22 says. He says, don't be just simply what? Hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Because if you're just simply hearing the word, but you're not putting it into practice, he says, you're actually falling into deception. You're deceiving yourselves. You're deceiving yourselves. And so Ezra was a person that prepared his heart to seek God's word, to obey what he read. And then from that, then, he begins to teach others the statutes and ordinances of Israel. So now we see in Nehemiah chapter 8, this is exactly... What happened? So the wall now has been constructed. You'll see that in Nehemiah 6. 52 days, record time. Scholars that, that read that say that was record time. From the time that Nehemiah got there and started to lay brick on brick or block on block or whatever that looks like, 52 days later, the entire wall around Jerusalem was rebuilt and the gates were rebuilt because God was doing that. But then uh, uh, Nehemiah, uh, I guess, is, well, he's in here, you'll see this, but Ezra then is called. The people want Ezra now to stand up on this platform and to read God's word. So just the physical structure of the wall now has been, re uh, has been rebuilt, and now the reading of God's word is going to be given to them. And listen to this, and you're, what we're going to see in here, you're going to see the importance of brokenness, prayer, God's word, and separation or holiness in this whole entire section. Now we're going to go into chapter 9, and in all reality there is no chapter breaks, because that's what we're going to see primarily the importance of prayer. So Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. It says, All the people assembled with a unified purpose. Very important. They've got to be unified in mind and heart. At the square just inside the water gate. So they asked Ezra, the scribe that we just looked at, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law, God's word, of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. So on October 8th, Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the assembly which included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. He faced uh, the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon. Who could sit there that long in reading of the law of Moses, God's word? Who can sit there that long? It shows you how much they loved God's word, how much they were eager from early morning until noon, and read aloud to everyone who could understand. It says, all the people listened closely, very attentive, to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. And then to his right stood, and I've, uh, you can read it for yourself, I kind of removed the names. There's a bunch of names in there. I didn't want to kill them names because a couple of them I was like, that's going to hurt my tongue. A lot of guys were there. And to his left, the same list of a lot of guys were with him. Ezra stood on the platform in full view of, the, of all the people. <clears throat> when they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen, Amen. As they lifted their hands, then they bowed down and they worshipped the Lord. Brokenness. Who knows that to bow down before God, there has to be a level of uncle. I give up. I'm broken before you. You're almighty God. There's, they bowed down in this idea of brokenness and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, which I can pronounce him, and some other guys, a long list of guys, were there with him. Then instructed the people in the law while everyone remained in their places. So these people came down into the crowd and they began to kind of commentary, so to speak. And what is it? So Ezra reads... 
And they go down and they teach the people, and then how do you walk in obedience to this? That's what's happening here. They begin to instruct the people. They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were interpreting for the people said to them, Don't mourn or weep. We see a broken spirit there. Don't mourn or weep on such a day as this, for today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. When's the last time, you think about it, when's the last time you ever had a tear come to your eye from just simply reading God's word? Have you ever been choked up from reading it? It just it hits your heart in a, in, a, in a way that's different? I mean, that, that's an evidence that there's brokenness. There's, there's a, that's a kind of an evidence that there's this, this idea of that I want to be obedient to what the Lord has for me. And Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and, and share gifts of, I guess they didn't have diabetic issues back then, but um, all kinds of good food there. Sweet drinks and share, and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites too quieted the people, telling them, hush, don't weep. For this is a sacred day. So it's now, so the people went away to eat and drink at a festival. That means they were being obedient to what they just heard Ezra re read, and the other ones just, um, kind of give them commentary for how to walk in obedience to it. So they went to eat and drink at a festival to share gifts of food and to celebrate with great joy because they heard God's word and understood them, understood what God's word had to say. On October 9th, the family leaders of all the people, together with the priests and Levites, met with Ezra to uh, describe, to go over the law in greater detail. You can almost kind of reread that today and say, and they met at home group, and they wanted to talk a little bit more about what God's word had to say. That's exactly what, how you can look at that. They met outside of their, 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 their normal gathering. You know, we traditionally gather on Sunday morning to worship the Lord and to, and to be with one another and to encourage and pray and look at God's word. And then somewhere else, else they got together to understand this in a greater way. As they studied the law, they discovered. Have you ever just read the Bible and discover something? <laughs> you know, First John, you guys know that First John my favorite book. I love it because it's short and it's right to the point. That's why I like John. He's short. He's right to the point. He's, he's very black and white. He doesn't beat around the bush. That's why I like it. I've read that. I've read First John. I don't know how many times. I've taught through First John. I don't know how many times. I still read First John and still just there's some, you get impacted by it because that tells me that. It's living and powerful. It's that sharp two-edged sword that the Bible says of itself, God's word. So they discovered that the, that the Lord had commanded through Moses uh, that the Israelites should live in shelters during uh, the festival to be held uh, that month. He had said that a proclamation should be made throughout their towns and in Jerusalem telling the people to go to the hills to get branches uh, from olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees. They, so they, they were to use these branches to make shelters in which they uh, would live during the festival as prescribed in the law. We know this to be the festival of booths, or the tabernacle of booths, is one of the things that God gave them to do to worship him. So, so now the people were obedient. They would go out there in verse 16 and cut branches and use them to build shelters on the roofs of their homes, in their houses, in their courtyards, in the courtyards of God's temple, um, or in the square just inside the water gate and the Ephraim gate. So everyone who had returned from captivity lived in these shelters during the festival, and they were all filled with great joy. It's interesting, when you start walking in obedience to God's word, how joy becomes the thing that guides you. I mean, isn't that kind of like what walking in the spirit, Galatians 5 is? Instead of giving yourself over to the lust of the flesh, when you begin to walk in the spirit, what is, what is the, some of the things that the spirit does in your life? Love, joy, peace, Rick said. Love, joy. There's first two, joy. There's joy when you begin to walk in obedience to the Lord as you walk in the Spirit. The Israelites had not celebrated like this since the days of Joshua, son of Nun. We know that to be back in Ezra. So we know at some point there they were celebrating uh, the festival years earlier under uh, the leadership of Ezra. Uh, actually, Zerubbabel. Um, and then something happened. They stopped doing it. We looked at that last Sunday for about 16 years. They just stopped. Why, you remember why they stopped? Walking in obedience to the Word of God. We looked at it last Sunday. 
profit, major profit, or minor profit, but a major profit that God raised up to speak to that condition. Haggai 1. What was their problem? Yeah, like if you remember Haggai 1, like Mike said, they were more concerned about their homes, their life, the things of this world, than they were about the command to go rebuild the temple and to reestablish worship. This idea of being revived or experiencing revival. They got caught temporarily, and it was a significant amount of time, it was years, and then God raises up Haggai, and comes and speaks to them and says, what are you, don't you realize the reason why you're bringing all this money in from your job and it seems like you've got holes in your pants pockets and your saving accounts are dwindling and you're not saving money and the more you make, the less you have because you're not walking in obedience. Now start walking in obedience, start doing as I've commanded you to do to rebuild this temple, then I will bless you. And that's exactly what we see in Haggai too. They repented, they turned, they begin to do the work, and all of a sudden God begins now to bless them. And this is the last time, as, um, as was being told to us here, that they actually walked in obedience. So as years went by, that drifting happened again. Verse 18, Ezra read the book of the law of God on each of the seven days of the festival. Then on the eighth day they held a solemn assembly as was required uh, by law. Now I don't want to stop because like I said, there's no chapter and verse break in, in the Bible that was given for our benefit. It goes right into this next one, chapter 9. On October 31st, the people assembled again. At this time, they fasted and dressed in a burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. It was a sign of, of mourning, a sign of brokenness before the Lord. Those of um, Israelite descent separated, now here's this idea of separation, separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. They remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord uh, their God was read aloud to them. How fast do you think the storehouse, and I hope it wouldn't, would dwindle or any church? If you all just come in here, I read the Bible for three hours. Three hours. Would you stay? I mean, if, if, if the Lord's presence was there, I'm sure we all would stay. Three hours, that's what happened. Uh, they remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord their God was read aloud to them. Then for three more hours... They confess their sins and worship the Lord their God. When I look at that, that's the way I think the church is built. Who's doing church six hours? Who knows that some places in the world they do church six hours? You went to Haiti. What are they doing in Haiti? Yeah, you're like, do these Haitians ever get hungry? <laughs> well, I was in Nicaragua. There's no, there's no this. Looking at the clock, it's all. I mean, for them, when they gather, it's it's they gather together. It's it's they get family. I mean, we study, we watch that movie, um, Sheep Among Wolves, Iranian Church. That's the same thing. They're just with each other, and we see this here. Three hours they're listening to the word of God, and another three hours they're confessing their sins to the Lord. It says, the Levites, Joshua, and there's a list of guys, stood on the stairway of the Levites and cried out to the Lord their God with loud, voice, with loud voices. Then the leaders of the Levites, Joshua and this long list of men, called out to the people. He says, stand up and praise the Lord your God, for he lives from, for, from everlasting to everlasting. Then they prayed. Now listen to this beginning of this prayer. May your glorious name be praised. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and seas and everything in them. You uh, preserved them all, and the angels of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God, and the prayer goes on through chapter 9. It's interesting, if you look at chapter 9 for some reason, I don't know what it is about that, but if you look at here in Nehemiah chapter 9, Ezra chapter 9, and Daniel chapter 9, all three of them chapters are a huge thing of prayer. Now Daniel's before, we know Daniel's after the captivity, as he went into Babylon, this is before all this happened, but we see Daniel praying in Daniel 9. Ezra's praying in Ezra 9. We, we see the prayers all being offered here in Nehemiah 9, and they're all of them, even Daniel, confessing his sin, his family's sin, the nation's sin, broken before the Lord. You don't ever get a sense when you read those three chapters or any other kind of chapters like them, the people ever asking for anything. Did you hear them ask for really anything at the beginning of this prayer? And you can read the remainder of the prayer. What is the focus of their prayer? What 
Worship. I, I, you said worship, right? Worship. Confession. Who was the focus of their prayer? God, the Lord. You see that even through the book of Acts. When the church comes to life there in Acts chapter 2, there's prayers being offered. There are always, it says, of one accord together, praying with one another. Even after Peter and John was arrested in Acts chapter 3, and they were released after they were threatened. It says they go back to the assembly, their brothers and sisters, they go back to the church, and they begin to pray. And it's very similar prayers. What they do is it's almost like, you know, when, G, uh, when Jesus teaches us how to pray, you know, this is how you pray, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name, hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You can see that model. And when you see that in Acts 4, when Peter, they all lift up their voices, they said, God who made heaven and earth, things that are seen and unseen. The sustainer of all things. Isn't that worship? It's all about you, Lord. That's what we see here. It's all about you. And what was the prayer that Peter and John had and the rest of the assembly had? Lord, uh, guard us against their threats. Lord, you know, I, you know, I pray the next time that we're arrested that the beatings aren't as worse or the threatenings are not as worse. What was their prayer, if you know that Acts 4 section? Give us boldness to speak your word. Give us even greater boldness to speak your word. And Luke tells us that the place that they were in was shaken. Is like God said, amen to that. That's the prayer I will answer. And it says they went out speaking the word with great boldness. Their focus was on the Lord. But there has to be a level of brokenness before we can get to that kind of praying and a love for God's word before we get to that kind of level of praying. This idea of separation. Do you think it's hard for God to ask us to be separated? Do you think it's a, do you think it's a bad thing? What does that look like today in 2019 going into 2020? For the separation, holiness. That's what it means to be sanctified. That's what that word I means. All those words are together. That's what they mean. So, so how Mike started it, I don't know exactly how you said it, but he said, I don't want to be unfriendly or something, or I don't want to be, you know, I, none of us are called to be that. We're to love our enemies, <laughs> but we're not, to be, we're not to be unfriendly. But who do we hang with? Who's your inner, I always say that, whoever's in your inner circle, that will guide you on how you're going to live your life. Walk with the wise and be wise. Walk with fools and be fool, like a fool. There's nothing wrong with um, having that. And that's what you see in the church. That's what you see in this assembly uh, of God's people. Um, don't associate with that because what's going to happen, they're going to always lead you away from the Lord. Bad company corrupts good morals, Paul says to the church in Corinth. Bad company or evil company corrupts good morals. Be careful who you listen to. Today it could be who you listen to, who you um, you know podcast with, who you, I mean, I don't know, all the, all the internet we got and everything that you do. Who are you reading? Who are you listening to? Who are you associating with? Whoever, who knows, um, oh, what's his name, Caleb, uh, UFC guy, I can't think, his name's escaping me. Yeah, Joe, who, does anybody know Joe Rogan? Maybe you don't get into it. I used to watch UFC if you're into mixed martial arts and all that stuff. Joe Rogan, he, was, was a com he, he did a commentary, very, uh, I think he even practiced it. He has a podcast, I don't know what it's called. But if you listen to Joe Rogan, he's actually a pretty smart guy. He's actually a pretty smart guy. He has some interesting topics. And like, and I was, somebody had mentioned him, so I had pulled up one of his podcasts. I was, I don't recommend him. He doesn't use right language. But I was, I was listening to him, and there's a lot of people that follow that guy. And I was like, you know what? He could draw folks in. He's a very, he's a man's man. He's a, um, he's very knowledgeable that his topics are whatever they are. And it's like, and what happens is you get into that, and the next thing you know, you start thinking like him. And he'll talk about religion every once in a while. And he starts to put little crazy seeds in your mind. It's the same thing with anything that we do today. Who do we associate with? Who is our closest friends? Like Mike said, we're not to be unfriendly. We're in the world, but what? Not of the world. We're like a ship sailing. Like we're the ship, uh, the world's the ocean, 
as a ship sails through the ocean, it's, getting to, it's going to get to its destination eventually, but what happens when the water starts getting into the ship? It so will sink it. That's, that's the way it is. When you, when you stop or you allow the, the world to get into your life, over time it will begin to, to sink you. And that's why there's such a, a strong a word about the love of the world that, that's given to us. James 4.4, 4, that's a tough one. Holy Spirit says, if you make yourself a friend of the world, he says you make yourself an enemy of God. Think about that. If you have a friendship with this world, you have a, it's the thing we talked about last week. Remember Lot's wife, Jesus said in Luke 17 and verse 32. Remember Lot's wife. There's, like, her flesh and her outward being was being moved out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Her heart was still connected to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why she looked back. She lingered for a moment to can still consider. She still loved the world. And it's what happened. And she got turned into a pillar of salt. We've got to be careful of that. And so sometimes we're talking about, you know, how does revival come? How does it stay? You know, the Lord, it, the Lord just doesn't work in compromise. He never has. Jesus said, once you put your hand to the plow, don't look back. He who looks back isn't worthy of the kingdom. Being focused, you know, in the right direction, having the right people in our lives. Separation is a huge thing. And that was the main problem that got the nation of Israel in all kinds of a mess. They began to mingle with things. They began to entertain things. That's what happened to Solomon's life. All of a sudden, his wife, and Solomon says it, and they turned me away from Jehovah. They turned me away from Jehovah. You know, people that are outside the church, if they was to listen to something like this, they'd be like, oh, you guys are judgmental. And, you know, you think you're better than all of us. No, I know exactly how I am. I need Christ. <laughs> yeah, I'm not better. I'm just better off, Mike said. For any of us that can remember our days before Christ, who would admit that you're better off? I'm not better than anybody, but I am better off. My eyes now have been opened. I want to read 2 Corinthians 6, and we know this verse, most of us probably are very familiar with, is this idea of separation, because it's key. It's absolutely key to your, our spiritual life. I would even add, it's key to uh, being blessed by God. Obedience. Obedience to God's word is key. Paul tells us this about this very topic that we're looking at from Nehemiah. He says, don't team up with, or translate, some of the translations will say, don't be unequally yoked. With those who are unbelievers. What does that look like? Okay, Paul, you just said that to the church of Corinth almost 2,000 years ago. What does that look like today? Do not be unequally yoked with those that aren't believers. Marriage, business adventures, friendships. I mean, business adventures, you think about it. So me and Rick, I'll, I'm the unbeliever, you're the believer. We go into a, a gun, whatever, what is it that you do? I can't think. Um, fixing guns, you fix guns. Buy them too. What if we go in that business together? And you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna run your business to honor God, but I'm not a believer, and I'm gonna cook the books. I, I gotta make a little bit more money, and so I'm gonna lie to Mark and so I'm, gonna, you know, I'm gonna buy this at this price and sell it at an exaggerated price and go to pocket, you know, whatever. And it's like all of a sudden you catch wind of that. You're the one that's in the dilemma. I'm not really that in the dilemma because I don't have no morals really. <laughs> but you, but if you knew that I was an unbeliever. And going into that together, same thing with marriage. You don't ever go into a marriage. You never should go into a marriage knowing that the one that you love does not love Christ. Now, it's a different story that if you are married and then you come to faith. That's what Paul's addressing when he addresses the church in Corinth. If you, if you both are unbelievers, and one of you, it's usually it's the woman. Well, that's the Lee Strobel story. If you know the case for Christ guy, uh, the wife comes to faith normally first. And then the instruction Paul gives, because God's word gives us for everything we want. Paul says, now, stay with him. Stay with him. Live your life for Christ. Because maybe what will happen is that you will win him for Christ by your chaste conduct. The same thing goes around. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you go into a marriage, they call it missional dating, which is a nightmare. If you go into marriage thinking, you know what, I love this guy and I'm attached to the person, or I love this girl and I'm attached to her, I just like her. Yeah, I know that she's not a believer. I know she doesn't have the interest in the things of the Lord. And so I'm going to marry this person. And through my witness, they're going to come to faith in Christ. Took my mom 26 years. Are you willing to go through 26 years of hell? 26 years. Think about it. In that union, Christ, and we're going to see this in here, Christ and the devil is represented. That's a tough thing to consider. 
1 John 5, consider it. We are of God, and the rest of the world lies under the sway of the wicked one. We are of God, that's the church, and the rest of the world, all the unbelievers, lie under the control or the sway, the influence of the enemy. So now you're going into this marriage, and you have one darkness, one light, trying to live together. How is he going to... How is he going to pray for you? How is he going to instruct you? How is he going to care for you if he doesn't love the Lord? He's not going to do it. It's a huge thing, especially today. He says, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? You hear the answer in it. It can't. How can light with darkness? It can't. What, har what harmony can there be between Christ and some translations say Belial or the devil? The, the word actually means wickedness. How, between Christ and wickedness, it can't. How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? They can't. And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? There can't be. For we, we know this according to 1 Corinthians 3, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you, and I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. What's the condition for great communion with the Father? We just heard it. I will be your father, and I will walk with you, and you will walk with me, and I will live in you. We're going to abide. It's not John 15. We'll abide together. But there's a, there's a prerequisite there. Isn't there? Obedience. What does God's word say? Don't be connected to the unbeliever. It's the same condition that Israel found itself in. I mean, go through Ezekiel. You know, they thought worship was going great. <laughs> God's like, nope. I see things you don't see, Ezekiel. And he snatches them up by the locks of his hair, and he pulls them into the temple, and he says, look what they're doing. Look what the priests are doing. And he begins to carve away. Look at their hearts. Oh, they claim to serve me with their lips, but their hearts are actually serving Baal. Their hearts are serving Molech. Their hearts are bowing. Now look at the women. They're facing the east. They're worshiping Tammuz, and they're going after all these other gods. That was God's assessment of his temple where he was to dwell in the Holy of Holies. This is my dwelling place, and look what they have now partnered themselves with. God did something about it. He took them into captivity. Read Lamentations. When God judges, he judges thorough. Read Lamentations. That's the aftermath of them not walking in obedience and ignoring Jeremiah specifically, but other prophets. They were killed by the sword. Starvation hit their land. God chased them to Egypt when they tried to flee from him. and got him, He got them down there. I'm not making it up. Just read it. Those kind of things begin to smoke me because then I look at this right here. It's the same admonition that Paul gives us by the same Holy Spirit. Don't have a connection with them. Be separate from them. Like Mike said, we're to love folks. We'll look for you know, opportunities to get into their lives, yes, but be very, very careful. Because those opportunities that we use as we get into their lives, and if, especially if it's more intimately or closely through a relationship or a friendship, they, over, they, over, they will influence you. I told you the story that I still regret to this day happened about 15, 18 years ago. But I laughed at the joke at, at the briefing. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. So he responded better than I did. I actually laughed at it. And like I said, it haunts me to this day. I don't know why. I, I think about that often. Because what I did is I actually um, destroyed a witness with a gentleman named Denny. who was watching me. I, I never thought you would laugh at that, John. <laughs> I still remember those words like he said to me yesterday. Because what happened? Because I was trying to be with like the crew. I didn't, have to, I, I didn't necessarily have to be nasty or anything. I could just simply went about my business. But the closer that we get with the world, I'm telling you, sometimes they will corrupt you. Bad company corrupts good morals. Be careful with what you're listening to, what you're reading, who you're hanging with. Like Mike said, we are to get out into the world. Jesus prayed that in John 17. We're to go to the world. But he says it's the unity that you have with one another that will prove to the world that the Father sent me. It's how we get along. It's, who you associate. it's with us we associate. And when we leave out of here to, uh, this morning and we go about our lives, our lives should be focused on Christ. Our lives should be focused on obviously winning for people for Christ. And our lives need to be focused on examining myself daily that I'm not getting consumed and caught in 
to the things of this world. And when those things happen, I believe at some point, I think God honors that. When we're obedient to his word, we love his word, we desire the pure milk of the word, we're in genuine prayer, we have a brokenness before the Lord, and we're separating ourselves from the things that are unholy. Peter says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Be holy, separated. Anybody, we'll just finish. Does anybody got any thoughts, questions on this? We probably could have spent two months talking about revival. Because I think if we're honest with ourselves, all of us are at some level in our individual lives in need of some kind of reviving. To be solely focused on Christ, the mission of us, the church, and us individually. Thoughts or questions? Did I say anything too hard? Sometimes God's word will step on your toes a little bit. But why does it do that? It draws to him. Mike said, if we understand the heart of the Father, it's, it's always of love. Our best, it, he always has our best. Always has our best. What's that? Say that one more time. I'm going I'm to process that. You said, things worth having are not easy. Is that what you said? Things? How hard, how hard is it to maintain? Clark Robinson often says, that we should live our lives with a very loose grip on things because overnight or quickly they can be taken away. And we should always be what? Having a grip on Christ. He'll never go. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time of spending in your word. And <clears throat> we're considering a man and maybe several men that you used in a great way to restore worship to restore lives. Lord, we thank you for the faithfulness of Nehemiah, for Ezra. Lord, we thank you for the faithfulness of others that we can look to that are walking faithful with you, that have a love for your word. Lord, we know that they're in prayer. They have a communion with you, Lord. We can see by their lives that they live in a state of brokenness and contrition before you, that desiring to be separate from the world. Lord, help us if there's any area of our lives that we're connected, Lord, to things that would dishonor you, that you would show that to us. Lord, give us the strength to repent and to turn away from them. Lord, we believe that your <clears throat> approach for us is, is coming, and so we know that your word says that you're coming back for a pure church, a righteous church, a church without spot and blemish, a church that's not stained by the things of the world, a church that's ready and prepared that you'll, be fi you'll find us worshiping, Lord, and working for you with the right heart. You'll find us faithful so that you'll be able to say to each one of us on that day, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Lord, help us to understand and to see any area of our lives that might need reviving, refocusing, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.